Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm pleased to welcome back my friend for the fourth appearance, his fourth appearance on the record tying fourth appearance on the Power Hungry Podcast, Roger Pilkey Jr. Roger, welcome back. Wow, four times. That's, that's great. <laughs> you, good to be here. You and Meredith Angwin, you're in good company. You and Meredith Excellent. have both been on four times. Um, so there is a lot to talk about, and we'll get to those. But uh, Roger, you know, uh, guests introduce themselves. So if you don't mind, uh, that law still applies or that rule, I'll call it a rule. It's not the iron law, but it's close to it. Uh, introduce yourself, please. Bryce's Law. All right. I'm Roger Pelkey Jr. I'm a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. I study sticky, complicated issues where science and politics meet. And currently I'm working on issues of energy policy, climate policy, uh, and eligibility requirements for male and female classification in elite sport, um, all of which uh, are pretty intense issues. Messy. Yes. Messy. Uh, the definition of messy. Well, sure. So you're, you got to remind myself that you got your PhD in political science. So you do work in this, these messy intersections. And I warned you before we started, I wanted to ask you about, I mean, how you look around the world today, because I, you know, I, I give a fair number of presentations and I, I get there and often joke, well, geez, I don't know. I have an hour. I don't know what we're going to talk about because there's nothing happening in the world lately, but <laughs> It, it, it is remarkable the disorder and the peril that is apparent, particularly for Europe in terms of energy and energy policy, um, high energy prices, inflation. So I'll, I'll ask the question, are, are we in a more perilous position? This is what I wrote down. Are we in a more perilous position today than we were pre-COVID? Because it sure seems more dangerous. What, what's, what's your take? Yeah, you know, I think back to that. I mean, there's a saying, I won't get it right, but you know, there's sometimes decades go by and, and nothing happens. And sometimes months go by and, and decades happen. Um, <laughs> I, I tend to, to agree that we're in kind of a period of you know, enormous uncertainty and churn and uh, disruption that you know, probably not you know, really in my lifetime that we've seen since the end of the Cold War in the you know, late 80s, early 90s. Well, that's interesting. Well, so what, I mean, what do you make then of, uh, I mean, I know you're not, I don't see you necessarily claiming to be an expert on international affairs, but handicap this for me. I mean, how do you see, because the last time you were on the show uh, was in February of this year before the Ukraine invasion. What do you make of that? What do you, I mean, what are your big takeaways in kind of the international politics these days? Is Russia winning, losing? Who's coming out the loser on this? Is it Europe? What do, how do you see it? Yeah, I, I mean, my view as the, you know, an observer who's, you know, <laughs> I'm not an international relations specialist, but there's enormous uncertainty about how this is going to develop. Um, and, you know, one thing I think we've learned and in both of our area of expertise, energy policy, um, is that the world is, um, it's still as interconnected as it's ever been. And there mm. are going to be ripple effects everywhere. Um, and that uncertainty and managing that uncertainty is going to require a degree of international coordination, um, probably like we haven't seen in decades, um, and countries are going to have to think carefully about self-interest and shared self-interest in ways that you know maybe we didn't have to so much in, in recent decades. Well, well, let me ask you about that because that's been, I mean, this we both talked about this, and you coined the iron law of, of climate, which I've uh, stolen completely and and attribute as often as I can with my own iron laws on a light iron law of electricity, iron law of power density, yeah, right. but the but that idea of cooperation, I mean, and you, you, you're looking at this both in energy policy and on uh, the Olympics and on, you know, internet, drug testing and these other things. So well, let me ask that question. Are we seeing any more cooperation or the nations of the world any more inclined to cooperate now than they were in the past? Ian Bremmer was on the podcast a while back and he said, well, look at how quickly Europe united and, you know, now Finland and Sweden are joining NATO, NATO that there has been a, a marked degree of international cooperation that maybe we didn't have before. How do you see that? Yeah, I think that's right. I think that makes sense. I mean, it's, 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 it's I think, easier, quote unquote, easier to have a degree of cooperation in the aftermath of a shock like, you know, which for many people, not everyone, but for many people, Russia's invasion of Ukraine came as a shock. Um, and it was one thing for Europe to come together in ways maybe that Putin didn't anticipate. It's quite another thing for that uh, degree of agreement to persist over time and over maybe the years and longer that it's going to take to deal with this issue. Uh, I just you know, saw last week that um, countries in Southern Europe were asked to 
you know, basically take a haircut on, on energy um, in order to, you know, help support Germany uh, through next winter. And the reply was, you know, politely, you know, no, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so sustaining that sort of collaboration and cooperation over time, I think is going to be the real challenge, even though I, you know, I, I agree with Bremer that there were some very positive um, indications in the immediate aftermath of the invasion. Right. Well, isn't that since you brought it up that that idea and it was what Spain, Fran, uh, Spain, Greece, uh, one other, they said oh, they were asked to cut their gas consumption by 15 percent. And they said, well, we'll do with what we need to do. I mean, right. is this just another Well, explain the iron law of climate? And is that is that does that fit into that that construct that uh, in terms of the iron law that countries yeah, are doing what mean, they need to do for themselves? Yeah, I mean, the iron law of climate was 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 a, a concept I coined, <laughs> excuse me, in um, you know, more than a decade ago to explain to people that that GDP, making people personally less wealthy or limiting their ability to 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 grow more wealthy um, was not going to be a lever that we have to reduce emissions. Um, and so if we create policies where economic growth comes into con conflict with emissions reduction, economic growth is going to win every time. So, you know, the lesson is don't do that. <laughs> don't, yeah. don't don't force that that trade off. Um, but what we're seeing, and you've written you know, eloquently about this lately, is people need energy. They need electricity. Um, and if, if the costs of um, energy services associated with, with that go up, um, the price of food goes up, the price yeah. of transportation goes up, um, and not everybody's Elon Musk. Um, it's going to affect how they live. And if it affects how they live, they're going to respond. And in some places, they respond by marching in the streets. Um, some places they respond violently. Um, so I think we, sh we are seeing the consequences of, um, of, of, you know, it's bigger than the iron law of climate change. This is, you know, what you say, the iron law of electricity. This is that people, people want energy and they're going to do what they have to do to get it at a rate that they can afford. And you see that unrest, and I th I'm glad you brought that up because in Sri Lanka, in a total, I mean, total com societal meltdown for mis- I mean, caused by just frankly, just bad, bad policy it connected to ESG, which I want to talk about as well. Right. But you see the yellow vest movement in France. You saw the Dutch farmers protesting. I mean, these are all seem to be very much interconnected in, in this, the, the, I'm going to say it this way. I don't like to talk in these terms, but the elites, the political elites, the, the, the NGO elites saying you're going to use less and we're going to decide. And the, the working class and, and, and lower class is saying, no, that's not what we voted for. Or that's not what we want. And so it seems like there's a growing, it's part of going back to my first question about the unsettledness of the world. That to me is, is a newer kind of a, a development that we haven't seen before, right? Multiple public, I, I would call it a, a, a wide ranging public backlash in multiple different countries based around the same kind of policies, right? The rejection of bad at, at fundamentally bad energy policy am i is that am i misreading that no i i, I think I, I agree i mean part of the issue was um you know that many countries around the world have committed to a, a green transition all right that's great you know what does that mean um but if it comes at it generally the, means poverty <laughs> well i mean if it means if it means uh losing security of supply or uh control over the economics of energy um, you know, both of which I think Germany has experienced by not balancing out, you know, s the supply and demand sides of the equation, then you're going to have some political volatility that results. Um, you know, there should be some pretty profound lessons taken, um, you know, so far from the, the, the energy supply crunch by reliance on Russian natural gas in particular. Right. Um, but that's not the only place in the world where, um, you know, democracies, democracies rely on energy supplies from places that could become unstable. Yeah. And so, you know, more security, I think, is one of the lessons that's come out of this. And how you balance security with, um, you know, the, the goals of a green transition is something that we haven't worked out yet. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think that that's right. And I think that Germany is the, and you, you're familiar with Germany. I know you, you had some experience there, been there. You lived there for a while, no? Am I, am I missing No, I taught or? there uh, a few times. Never, yeah. never fully yeah. made the move. Yeah. Right. But that there, but it, not just Germany, but all of Europe is looking at a deindustrialization, and the knock-on, the potential knock-on effects of that are just scary. And I mean, I one of my last uh, guests on the podcast was a uh, uh, John Constable, who what was his line that he said Europe risks becoming a theme park of its own cultural past. 
I mean, you know, by, because of this deindustrialization, which I thought an amazing way to describe it, but this, yeah, but that Europe, as we have known it as a, as a manufacturing hub, I mean, we've already really seen it in Britain, but the, the, there is the looming possibility of this happening in Germany as, Germany as well, no? Yeah, you know, I, I tend to be a little bit more optimistic. Um, you know, the saying that, you know, the, 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 the best cure for, for high energy prices yeah. or for high energy prices, um, you know, the best cure for Europe's political troubles right now are, are Europe's political troubles. Mm. Um, I, I have a lot more faith in democratic systems such as, you know, across the European continent that, that governments will have to be responsive to, to their citizens. Mm. Um, that may come with some disruption, with some strife, with some upheaval, which is never great. But in the end, people are demanding, um, you know, more, more reliable, more accessible, lower price energy. And I think in democratic systems, they're going to get it. Um, mm. It may take a while to get there. But, the, you know, the simple fact, I mean, this is, would be, have been unthinkable to, to most people last year at this time that Germany is talking about keeping its nuclear power plants open. Maybe yeah. restarting a couple um, is is that is is not a result of technology um, or economics. That's a result of politics. That's that's democratic politics right there. So um, if Germany can turn on a on a basically turn on a dime with nuclear energy, um, I'm I'm pretty confident that you know the European conf- comp- continent is going to get through this. It's going to be difficult, but um, I, I don't think it's going to be a theme park quite yet. Yeah. Well, fair enough. So, well, then last thing on the, on Europe, since we're, I mean, no, this is not, you don't claim to be a, a geopolitical strategist, but you're an observant. Does the EU survive? I mean, Britain's already out. Is this, I mean, it's just because now the Euro's at parity with the dollar. Does the European Union, as we've known it, survive this or is something else going to take its place? Yes. I mean, I'm going to have a front row seat because uh, next month I'm moving to Oslo uh, for my sabbatical in Norway, what? which is. Wait, no, no, you didn't. I didn't hear about this. For, yeah, yeah. How long is that? How long is the sabbatical? So that's for this fall. I'm going to be at the University of Oslo, uh, helping them implement a pandemic research center. Norway is part of the broader European community. It sits on the doorstep of the EU. Um, it has its own. Uh, you don't hear Norway much in discussions of European energy policy because Norway is one of the countries that has uh, some of the mo- most secure supply. Um, you know, thanks to hydro and uh, domestic hydro and its own uh, natural gas in the North Sea. Right. Um, and I expect to have a front row seat to see what's going on. I am quite optimistic, actually, about the, the future of Europe. Um, I mean, the, the events of the last year may lead to the EU expansion. Um, the, Europe um, operates on a consensus model. And uh, because of there's going to be widely differential impacts uh, due to energy policy, because of different rates of reliance on Russian energy and different domestic energy supply, we're going to see that push to the limit. Um, and um, I do think the commitment, you know, my experiences in Europe are that the commitment, again, of the elites um, to the European project is incredibly strong. Um, and that's kept in check by the, the, the will of the democratic uh, populace. Mm. So it'll be a fascinating set of dynamics to observe. So does then Britain become more in the U.S. orbit then? I mean, Constable was even suggesting that Britain comes becomes part of NAFTA or that Britain moves more toward the U.S. and away from Europe. Does that sound plausible to you? Yeah, it does. I mean, British politics is is a mess. I don't, I don't know how to yeah <laughs> politely say it. it's quite a quite a mess. You know, I did a paper on the the UK Climate Change Act in two thousand eight, um, and I cited as one of the analyses that I've done where I got things the most wrong. In that paper, I, I put forward a number of scenarios for for emissions um, growth and then decarbonization in the British economy. And the lowest rate of GDP growth um, that I used was 1.5% per year uh, per capita. And it turned out that since 2008, you know, after the global financial crisis, um, the, the British economy has just, has just underperformed compared mm-hmm. to historically. And that's led to a deindustrialization, um, arguably to you know, thematic symbolic politics over substantive politics mm-hmm. and the sorts of things that we've seen you know, with Boris Johnson getting pushed out and now they're talking about tax cuts for everybody and it just seems a little disconnected from reality which um you know who knows where internationally they wind up but being opposed to europe is just now baked into you know the 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 tory party in in the uk right 
Yeah, and their energy system is a mess. I mean, just a total mess. They don't, they they don't have enough coal fired plants. They don't, they 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 aren't drilling yet. They still haven't repealed their fracking ban, and they have enormous shale resources. But they're going to have to start drilling. I just don't think there's any other option for them over the long term if they want to remain an industrial uh, industrial producer of consequence. But let's talk about heat waves because I'm in <clears throat> I'm in Austin. It's been hotter than homemade sin here. I mean, just hot I mean, yeah. for a long time, and I'm used to it. I've been, you know, I, I grew up in Oklahoma. I'm used to long periods of hot weather, but uh, are they more common? Is human activity to blame for this heat wave? I know you've written a lot about this. The Washington Post recently declared summers are hotter, longer, and more dangerous than before. Is that true? Yeah, it is true. And it's interesting. You know, I wrote a piece um, for uh, for the New York Post uh, just this past week. They invited me to kind of explain, they asked me, explain, what does the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, say about heat waves? For our audience and you know i had 700 words so i had to boil it down but the take-home messages are yes heat waves globally have increased um one <laughs> important side note there is that um if you include the 1930s in the united states they haven't mm -hmm. um, they've increased since the 1960s which was a low point of the last century so they've increased but, well it all depends on where you start or what, what you include in the in the in the in the system or the uh numbers that you count and number that numbers that you're counting then is what i hear you saying yeah i mean i tell people you know kind of tongue-in-cheek but if you want to be a cherry picker and you want to show the u.s hasn't had an increase overall in heat waves start your data set in 1900 and if you want to show that there's been a significant increase start it in 1960. um <laughs> the expectation going forward is that the world will see more heat waves that's that's the heat waves are one phenomena that the IPCC uses its strongest language on. Uh -huh. And that language is that they are virtually certain. They don't say that about too many things, but they are virtually certain that heat waves have increased globally and they're going to increase in the future. Well, I just found your, uh, uh, well, this is what you said, what you just told us is that what you said, what you wrote in the, in the New York Post here, this is July 20th. There is a strong climate change connection, but you said the connection is not as strong in the U.S., um, and, and that, well, then you say here, you, let's expand on that. You said no one need die from extreme heat, but if that's going to be the case, this is one of the things that seems super obvious now is that whatever scenario you have on climate change, whatever scenario you have on renewables, uh, on growth of hydrocarbons, from nuclear, we're going to need a whole lot more energy and in particular, a whole lot more electricity to keep people from dying from heat waves. So wh why, why did you say no one need die from extreme heat? Yeah, well, there's, let me let me just two things here. One is let me follow up. So the one reason the U.S. Um, uh, North America hasn't shown the same increase in heat wave, um, the IPCC says it may be due to land use change, particularly um, agriculture, widespread agriculture and irrigation in the Great Plains. So that lets me give a shout out to my dad, whose research showed that you know 20 years ago, um, the the mitigating effects of of land use change. I'm um, sorry. Well, I hate, sorry to interrupt. So, but I, you know, I've inter interviewed your dad now. Gosh, yep. I don't know. It's more than ten years ago. I, you know, I interviewed both of you at the, because I thought your work was so interesting right. more than more than a decade ago. But explain what you, you, you. I know you said that very quickly, but I want to understand what you're why you're bringing up your father's work and what he said. Yeah. So, so one of the reasons why the United States doesn't show up as having an increase in. Uh, heat waves, if you include the 1930s, and this is the IPCC that says this, is uh, land use change. So anyone who's flown across the country, look out the airplane window, um, you can tell there's humans down there. Mm -hmm. You can see the, the, the checkerboards and you know, the, 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 the crops being grown. And, and when, uh, when there's widespread agriculture, it changes the, the reflectivity of the surface of the planet. You have leaves that give off um, that, that it, it have what's called evapotranspiration. Um, and then, you know, we take massive amounts of water and we irrigate. And that also changes things like where, where storms form and, and so on. And so the IPCC says, well, that might be one reason why um, the United States hasn't seen this increase in heat waves that we observe elsewhere. So and, those things act as, as cooling effects then? Is that, yes. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Okay, that's what yeah. I want to that, just make And that's sure tied into, you know, research my, my father did, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Right. So is your father still, you Roger Pilkey Sr., is he still publishing? What, uh, bring me up to, to speed on him. What's he doing? Yeah, he's had a couple papers this year. He's still, uh, he's retired, but he still works with students um, and has connections at a couple of universities so I'll, you know, with former students who are now full professors. So he's keeping, uh, keeping a toe in the water, so to speak. Gotcha. Um, 
Well, you also, uh, well, you point out on your Substack, you wrote about this, that heat waves of recent decades have not reached levels as seen in the 60s, in the 30s. Um, and then uh, you talk about the, uh, this issue around, you can, uh, around the measurement, but you also talk about, you wrote a recent piece. Well, no, I'm, I'm, let me go to this one first. On your Substack, the piece that's most popular there is the unstoppable momentum of outdated science. I just was looking at that this morning. And you're talking, as we've discussed before, about the continued use of RCP 8.5, which is the most extreme of these uh, climate scenarios. So, and we've talked about this before, are we still seeing this catastrophe bias baked into, I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing a lot about heat waves and you just talked about that, but are we, are you, are you, are you, your observation that we're still seeing catastrophe bias when it comes to reporting on climate and climate issues generally? Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate that, you know, one, one way that the climate community kind of projects, you know, what might happen in the future is to use different scenarios. And as we've talked about, and as I've talked about in a lot of places, um, the most extreme scenario of their little scenario set um, at one point was, was characterized as, our, as the reference scenario or what's also called business as usual. This is where we're headed right? if, if, if we follow our current path. Massive, massive growth, massive growth of coal consumption in particular is one of the main points that 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 scenario includes, right? Yeah, that scenario for that scenario to occur requires the number of coal fired power plants worldwide to increase by a factor of five by 2100. So instead of six or 7000 worldwide, we'll have 30 or 35,000. Wow. Uh, And that that seems a stretch, (laughs) to say the least. Um, (coughs) So that's out there. And so anytime um, you know, we have a heat wave or a hurricane or a flood, um, you know, it's natural in today's media environment. Well, they're going to connect that to climate change. But a lot of times what reporters will do is they'll go to the scientific literature and they'll say, well, what does it say for 2100? And they pull off the shelf these scenarios, uh, these papers built on these very extreme scenarios. And they say, well, what you just saw is going to increase by a factor of two, three, five, seven, whatever it happens to be. And we have a view that is... Um, you know, I think what you said is an accurate characterization, and a, a, an apocalypse bias in, in how we look at climate. Um, heat waves, I think, are really instructive because the World Health Organization says nobody needs to die in a heat wave. Um, we know. I mean, that's, that's one of the, the, the phenomena of which we know how to deal with um, when it comes to human lives. Right. Well, let's talk about that because that's the other part that I, I mean, I, I glancingly, glancingly mentioned it before, but just... It is so clear. And I, you know, you and I geek out around the BP statistical review, right? Every right. year you update your data yeah. and I, I look at it from different, you know, what's are the, what are the rates of growth and different things? And you pointed right. out, um, it was in July, your piece on July 8th on your Substack. And by the way, my guest is Roger Pilkey Jr. He's on uh, a prolific uh, author on Substack. You can find him on Substack at uh, Roger Pilkey Jr. Roger Pilkey Jr. Dot Substack.com. He's also on Twitter, Roger Pilkey, at Roger Pilkey Jr., you wrote in this piece, global, uh, July 8th, global decarbonization, how are we doing? That to fully replace fossil fuels will require deployment of about one nuclear power plant equivalent of carbon-free energy every day during coming decades. And then you, this is, you've done this before, right? You've, you've done these projections. But really, as you've done this over the years, if memory serves, you have a graph and you, should, you reproduce it every year. I guess you just plug in the new data into your spreadsheet and, and here you are that these goals around decarbonization net zero, they're nowhere close to being achieved. Is that a fair assess- a fair a summaration, summation of what you've been writing on this, on this topic? Yeah, and you know, credit where credit's due, the, you know, the, 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 the first calculation I saw about how fast we would have to deploy carbon-free energy came from physicist Marty Hoffert and colleagues um, in 2000, so mm-hmm. quite a while ago. Um, I first updated that in uh, 2010 for my book, The Climate Fix, and have been doing it annually ever since. And I guess, I mean, there's some good news and bad news to take from that. One is that the rate of deployment um, hasn't changed really since 2010. So in in a sense, we're treading water when it comes to um, retiring, let's say, fossil fuel infrastructure. And and this is really talked about. I mean, everyone likes to talk about the expansion, the deployment of wind and solar, maybe nuclear. Um, And it's important to understand that the deployment of carbon-free energy does not actually achieve decarbonization. What achieves decarbonization is when you retire the natural gas or the coal fire power plant, or you know, we, we, we replace um, a gasoline um, powered automobile. So it's that retirement side that's rarely discussed 
and you know virtually all of the additional carbon free energy that's been deployed in the last 20 years has been on top of expanding fossil fuel infrastructure yeah so it, it is um talking about emissions um, tends to to take our attention away from the fact that we really should be talking about fossil fuels if if deep de- decarbonization is indeed the goal that we want to achieve uh, this century right well i'm i'm just finishing a piece i've been working on it for a while just getting my spreadsheets together but just doing the analysis on the rate of growth in hydrocarbons versus the rate of growth in wind and solar because generally when we're talking about carbon free that is really the only that's Clean right. energy to me is code word for solar and wind because we nuclear has been out of the picture here in the U.S. for some time, unfortunately. But that the growth in hydrocarbons, both in the U.S. and globally, is just swamping any growth in renewables. I guess it's restating what you just said, right? And we're not retiring hydrocarbons. In fact, we're we're expanding the use of hydrocarbons. So, I mean, I'll give you the one quick number that comes to head to my mind. Last year in the U.S. alone. Oil consumption grew by 2.8 exajoules. That's four times the growth in in solar and wind. Four, four x. So yeah. you know it's, it's not close. I mean, yeah. hydrocarbons are just lapping renewables, and, and it's not the it's not a it, the race is, has been won a long time ago. Um, so then let, let's talk about ESG. And uh, you were one of the first to post a, a, a piece on Stuart Kirk. Uh, of HSBC. Um, and I've followed the ESG discussions at a, at a kind of remove. I haven't really written about it uh, a little. I've written a little bit about it. But talk about Stuart Kirk and what what you know about him now and why he was why you you wrote a long piece about him and what he did back in I guess it was in uh, May. Um, so who is Stuart Kirk and why was why is it why was his uh, his position on ESG so important? Yeah, so ESG, it refers to environmental, social, and governance. And these are areas in which, you know, the the basic idea behind ESG is to use finance and business to achieve societal environmental governance goals. So it includes everything from reducing carbon footprints to increasing the representation of women on boards, um, being more transparent in the governance of of companies. So it mixes together a whole bunch of stuff. Stuart Kirk, um, formerly of HSBC, um, and I don't know him personally, but he gave a, he gave a, a, a talk at um, a Financial Times sponsored um, investor conference, um, which, you know, if anyone who's seen these things, they're usually, you know, people selling their products and, you know, everything's great. Listen to this. You know, it's not the place of controversy let, or politics. Let us, let us manage your money. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he gave uh, uh, an incendiary talk where he said, here's why the, uh, climate change is not a risk to business. Mm. Um, and he said, you know, Amsterdam's below sea level, lovely place. Who cares if Miami, you know, if the sea levels rise six meters or whatever he said. Um, and it was a combination between what he said and how he said it that mm-hmm. led to kind of a viral reaction. Um, and, uh, you know, I wrote about some of the things he said are, you know, quite accurate and some of the things probably were designed to inflame and, you know, distract it from his message. Um, he posted on LinkedIn last week or the week before. He's no longer with HSBC and you know, starting his new venture. So good luck to him. Right. But you said it was a, he had a Jerry Maguire moment in the form of a short talk given a corporate conference on sustainable investing. But he, he essentially just went straight at the whole issue around ESG and what that what that should mean for investors versus the. Re- so, well, let me ask then the question about where we are on ESG in in my view, uh, the Ukraine war should be a real wake up call in terms of energy realism and energy yeah. humanism. I think that this is, it, it may be, I, I think it should be seen as an inflection point, particularly when it around issues of energy security. But is it an inflection point in terms of ESG? Because this is the danger of what happened to Europe could happen to you if you, if you do what Europe has done over invest in renewables, under invest in hydrocarbons. Yep. What, what, how do, where, the short, the short question is, so where, where is ES, where does ESG go from now? Is some of the shine falling away from it. What's, what's the, what, what's your view? Yeah, it's, it's funny. I mean, the cover of this week's economist is ESG. Hmm. Um, and they have a, a you know, a, a, a special report on, on ESG investing and quite the opposite of the conclusion that, that you're suggesting here. The economist is saying, you know what, the only thing that, that ESG should, should focus on is carbon dioxide emissions. 
That's well, it. That's what, well, that's what it's been, hasn't it? I mean, in my view, that the, what is the, well, that line? What ESG it stands? Uh, the ES the E stands for emissions, and the S and G are silent. There's nothing, yeah. there's nothing else about it. It's just <laughs> a, only about emissions. Yeah, I mean, one of the I mean, I've given a number of talks on this this summer, and one of the challenges is that what's called portfolio decarbonization. So if I take my investments, I have a fund, and I take it out of Exxon, and I put it into you know, I don't know, carbon dioxide removal. Some you know, the numbers will, or, yeah, right, yeah, 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 stripe or something like that. Um, my uh, my my balance sheet for quote unquote carbon might show that I've decarbonized my portfolio, but then you might say, well, what connection does that have to the real world? Where right. you know, if you want to decarbonize, you want to decarbonize the real world, and the answer is probably nothing. And so there's a lot of effort, a lot of consultancies out there, a lot of people studying carbon footprints. And, um, you know, a real fair question is, well, what difference does it make in the real world? And in a lot of cases, the answer is not much. Well, so what pops in my head, as you said that, because you've written about this as well, is this whole uh, divestment, right? That's being, in particular, well, name names. Uh, I've invited him to be on the podcast three times. He hasn't replied. Bill McKibben, big yep. proponent of divestment, right? Oh, we're going to quit this entity, this school, this investment funds, uh, is, uh, their investments in any hydrocarbon producer, and therefore that's a win. And as I recall, you've simply said, well, yeah, but somebody else bought that stock. They don't, you know, they may have sold it. It doesn't mean the company goes out of business. It's only their equities that are being traded around. So the, uh, the end result is zero. Is that, is, is that a fair comparison? I think to a first trading? approximation, I think that's a, that's a good estimate. I mean, the, the, when, when I, in my classes, I do this with, with students, is that whenever we take an action, there, there is in our mind some sense of a cause and effect chain that leads to the outcomes that you want. Mm. And so when people recommend a strategy like divestment, when my university has you know, students and faculty who say universities should divest um, from fossil fuel companies, the, the response I have is, all right, walk me through that. All right, you, you, how, how does that work and how does that achieve decarbonization? Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out, you know, and I've written about this for a long time, the more direct paths, right? We want technologies that can provide substantial amounts of energy supply at low cost. And if we want them to do that without emitting carbon dioxide, then you know, we only have a few technologies out there of the scale that can do that. And maybe it's nuclear, maybe it's you know, natural gas with some sort of carbon capture. Um, you know, the ability of solar and wind to you know, deploy to massive levels, you've written about this, I've written about this, is probably limited. So, so rather than these indirect routes where I'm trying to affect energy technologies by who my university invests in, let's just go straight to the <laughs> to where the action is. And that's, you know, technology, innovation, deployment. Um, and, and that's where the action has to be. So I find that a lot of those debates over divestment, um, ESG and so on are more, you know, they're symbolic and symbols matter, but, but they're pretty far from the causality chain that leads to real world outcomes. You know, I have to echo and repeat what you just said, because I think it's exactly right that the, the we have all this discussion around it. To me, there's the, the, the pathway is so clear. It's if we're serious about decarbonization, we have to get serious about nuclear in terms of at deployment at scale. But we've got to we've got to cleanse this regulatory morass around nuclear and we have to allow it to innovate and we have to have an industrial base that's going to allow that to happen. And really, so far, we don't have anything. I mean, it, we're just not making the kind of progress that's needed. And I, I mean, maybe this summer does that as well, right? Because uh, we haven't had big blackouts yet, but it's clear that our electric system is woefully under. Uh, undersized for the the possible the demand that appears to be coming both for heating cooling electrification more broadly etc that and and there seems no sensibility around that but I'm I'm you're I'm interviewing you here I didn't call you to tell yeah. you what well you know like. you know I don't think that's wrong but I think you know you don't have to look very far to see that you know energy supply disruptions whether it's in California or Texas or or just simply because of technological advance you know let's say battery cars truly explode and put enormous new demands or, or on, just or just catch on fire or just catch on fire. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry that was you're saying well, have have rapid growth you said have explode, rapid growth rapid exactly growth. exactly yes, okay yes <laughs> um that itself could you know prompt a crisis um yeah of, of of energy supply um you know gavin newsom in california is is opening up the possibility very carefully and tentatively and, and in a hedged way to keeping Diablo Canyon yeah. open. 
Um, which you know, is truly, which is truly remarkable. Now we'll see whether they accomplish it because there is a right. lot of momentum on the closure as well. And we were, yeah. I was just in California a few weeks ago, and but that's very positive. Similar to what you mentioned earlier about Germany, that there right. maybe, maybe, maybe there's some rationality that will in, in, intervene here. It, you know, it's it's it's. I mean, I, I I forget what the number is. But I think it's like eight percent of California's electricity supply comes from Diablo Canyon, and. It's one thing for people to talk about emissions, which is abstract. You can't see them. They're out there. And all right, it feels good. But when your electricity goes out, that, that is a motivator, I think, of political change, unlike, you know, really anything else. So, so if there are consequential impacts on either energy supply um, or energy prices in such a way that it really affects people, you're going to see a pretty strong democratic response um, that even the most most vehemently opposed to nuclear power in a place like California won't be able to sustain that. So I, if I'm a betting person, I think Diablo Canyon stays open um, just because it's <laughs> there's not a lot of alternatives. And that's a that's a big chunk of electricity for California. Well, I, I, I would tend to go. I would I, I like what you're saying there. <coughs> I, I, I hope you're right. I, I might be a contrarian and say, let's put some cash money on this, but I'm <laughs> never, but because I've seen what California has done so far and it's right, a lot right, of right. an incredibly bad energy policy that's regressive. And I've written extensively about that, but that's a different story. Um, so what do you think now about what's going on in academia? I mean, you've been on the front lines of these in terms of, I wouldn't say doxing or attempts at censorship <coughs> or so on. Has that moment passed or is that just, are we still seeing this, um, efforts to uh, cancel voices that aren't aren't towing the line. We talked about Stuart Kirk, but that's a little bit different. He's in the investment banking business, right. not, in, not in academia. But as you know, when it comes to academic analyses around deployment of renewables, decarbonization, I, 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 I trip over how many reports, how many studies are put out that, oh, renewables are the way, you know, this is, and there is, and, and, and the, and, and with catastrophic, you know, ca catastrophic outlooks as well that saying, oh, we're just new to do all this, right? And studies from Princeton, Stanford, Cal Berkeley, you know, all the ones that yep. has the, so the question is this, has the, is the dialogue debate uh, policy discussion in academia on these issues improved or has it continued to, to kind of just degrade? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, we could we could talk for a long time about academia. I spent my whole, literally my whole life in academia. My dad was a professor. I grew up on the campus of University of Virginia as a kid. Um, been at Colorado now for more than twenty years. Um, you know, I, I have strongly opposing feelings about academia. So on the one hand, I'm a full professor. I'm enormously privileged. I can write about whatever I want to on any day of the week. Um, I got students who are super smart that I love working with. Um, so in that sense, you know, it's, it's kind of like, have, you, know, you have job security and I have job security and I use it. Um, but on the other <laughs> what hand, do you, what do you mean by that? I have job security and I use it. What do you, so you have tenure. You, so I have academic bank, tenure you, in the U S system you bank on that. Yeah. And, and, and I learned this, I mean, I was, you know, it's a long story, but I was investigated by the U S Congress and attacked yeah. by the white house, um, you know, in, in 2015. Um, and you know, at the time I thought, oh my gosh, this is the end of the world. But you know, what I realized at the time is, even you know a powerful member of Congress, or even the 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 um, you know the scientific advisor to President Obama, um, you know they can make me uncomfortable, but you know my my I'm still going to pay my mortgage <laughs> at the end of the month, and if I can take the heat, then I, I'm still in the game. Mm. So so for me, it was a realization that actually ten year protections of U.S. academia um, are not to be taken lightly, and we shouldn't be afraid to say what we think. And when I say I use it, I mean, I, you know, one thing that, that people should know about the stuff I do, I mean, I call it like I see it. I might be wrong and I, they might disagree, but, you know, I have, I, I'm not saying what I say because I want to curry favor with this academic group or, you know, with my promotion committee, whatever. Um, and and there, you can't do that. And, you know, as, as Stuart Kurt showed, there's not a lot of places where you can be employed and you can actually do that. Right. Um, that said, academia and academics do tend to spin off into eddies and whirlpools of irrelevancy. Um, I much prefer engaging with um, policymakers, journalists, members of the public, you know, through social media and so my Substack, than I do going to academic conferences and you know, talking with other academics about issues that aren't so connected to the real world. Um, I have a lot of great colleagues. I'm happy to say all around the world who share a similar view. Um, 
but I think it is easier to, as an academic, particularly an early career academic, to, to get into academia and be trapped in the trappings of academia and forget about the, the students and the real world and everything else out there that matters. Well, but I think what, where I was going, or as you say that, it, it trapped in the orthodoxy around catas- uh, catastrophism and climate and, and, and also the the i mean i've seen very little work coming out of academic and i mean by you know they're in the ngo world yes but in the academic world supporting strong rollouts of nuclear energy for instance i mean i don't i, I don't can't to my you know i can right. i can cite 10 or 15 or 20 papers that i can say oh here's the, the case for renewables and robust renewables if only xyz and we build two or three or four times more high voltage transmission and you know because there's all that vacant you know it's but glossing over what to me are issues of first principles you know but i don't see much heterodoxy in in academia when it comes to the positions you've taken. <coughs> and, you know, there, you, it's a fairly yeah. small, a fairly fairly small club. I'm just calling it like I see it. Yep. In in terms of you saying, well, no, these scenarios are generally are wrong, and I don't see much in in, in terms of the big academic institutions with high profile people like yourself that have tenure or whatever, even coming close to uh, repeating what you're doing. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah. And I think, I mean, so what you're putting your finger here on, and I think it's very common across fields, disciplines, areas of study, um, are, are the small P politics of academia. Um, and, you know, I think Henry Kissinger said that, you know, people fight so hard about academic politics because the stakes are so low. Right. Um, there is, um, there's a lot of group think there's a lot of incentives to publish in this paper, not that paper. Um, well, is that, not well, how much of it is, is just that the herd mentality or group think that this is, th- this is the cool club and it's the bigger club and there, and I can get more funding or for yep. whatever that if I'm in that club, is that. Yeah. And I think, I mean, there's a Venn diagram. So like, you know, let's take nuclear energy. Um, there's no surprise that, that nuclear energy has historically been opposed by by individuals who are mostly on the left side of the political spectrum. Right. And it also happens to be that most um, faculty member at particularly US universities, but also in Europe are also on the left side of the political spectrum. Yeah. So you take those two things and you put them over and then of course, it's not surprising that um, academics tend to focus on um, topics for which academics have political interests in. And, but you'll find that in health, you'll find that in studies of the military, you'll find that in economics. Um, so I don't see climate as particularly unique. Um, the, the challenge I see it as, and I've talked about this a lot, climate policy to succeed needs to appeal to everybody, not just all America, everybody in the world. So the left, the right. And so policies have to be robust to um, the political spectrum. And so if, if, if we in academia don't have the capacity to, to engage heterodox ideas, then we're going to find a lot of the ideas we put out there for policy uptake get rejected. And, and that's just, that's just a, a natural consequence of, you know, not recognizing our own lack of diversity in the academy. Yeah, I like what you said there about that, that the, those policies have to be, have to have a appeal to everyone because I, I just wrote a piece. It was in Forbes. I published it uh, yesterday, uh, Sunday, yep. but about the, the rejection. In fact, Mid-American withdrew a wind project in, in, uh, in Madison County, Iowa, well, that has not gotten any press. I mean, you know, the, well, even the, the the plight of what's happened in Madison County, no pre, no coverage by main big media outlets. But it also, I, I see it as well through the lens of the academic world in that, well, none of the academics live out, you know, that are involved right. in this, are living in rural America. So the, the, to them, it doesn't matter. It doesn't even, it doesn't even, isn't even on their radar. Well, of course they want wind turbines and high voltage tra- out there, you know, but it, I, it, but I like that idea about it has to appeal to everyone, but it has to be both on footprint, it has to be on cost, it has to be on uh, uh, the other kind of social um, social license issues around right. what that policy should look like. And that's where you're saying that the failure is, that this right. failure to match the idea around climate and climate change and why you should care with what the cure is, right? Is that, is that my- Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of my colleagues, a um, good friend, uh, Matt Burgess, uh, a, a young professor in my department, has done a lot of work on political polarization and climate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, you know what he's found in his research is there's an enormous range of, of what we would call climate policies, both mitigation and adaptation, that, that are pretty appealing across the political spectrum. Um, it just so happens that in the, in the U.S. context, the, the party elites and the Democratic and the Republican Party, and I think they share this, this uh, point of agreement, finding common ground with your enemy? No, no, no. That's not a, that's not a good place to go. Mm-hmm. So there is a tendency to emphasize policies and proposals that divide people. 
So, you know, I wrote about this just this morning, you know, the latest is the climate emergency that maybe President Biden will um, will declare. If you take a look at it and you look at the history of emergency declarations, um, you look at Donald Trump's emergency declaration on the border wall. It's mostly just red meat for partisans. It's symbolic. And so people will argue about a climate emergency very passionately. Um, But again, that causal chain from, all right, you take this action, what happens in the real world? It's whatever, if it's declared or not declared, it's not going to move the dial on decarbonization in the United States. Whereas there's a whole bunch of policies out there that are boring, probably not particularly political. And are going to be hard work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I just saw your post. The the headline is a national climate emergency is the latest distraction from achieving effective climate policy. But it was interesting. And I hadn't seen these numbers. I think it was in a piece by David Foster Wallace, David David Wallace Wells. I I get those guys confused that pointed out that actually in in terms of polling data, only one percent of the elector or the voters of the people that were polled anyway, said climate was their most important issue. And yet for the Biden administration, it seems like they keep pushing this one thing, right? Instead of looking at the more, I don't hear them talking about nuclear energy at all, but that that's an aside. Right, right. Well, well, let's talk about Substack for a minute, because this is one of the things I know we chatted a, a little while ago on the phone about this, but but you're not writing, you said you, I saw you, your piece in the New York Post, but you're not writing for other outlets. You've really focused on Substack. And I, as a journalist, somebody who's I started in newspapers. I, you know, my whole career, you know, I wrote for the Tulsa, I've written for a lot of failed right. publications that printed on paper, you know, the right. Tulsa Tribune, Talk right. Magazine. I mean, I could give you a long list. Has journalism fundamentally changed with Substack? How do you view Substack in, in the political kind of the media uh, uh, universe? And then tell tell me about why you're, you know, why you're putting so much effort there, because you're, you're writing a ton, and maybe more than you ever have. I don't know if that's, <laughs> That's the case, but it sure is a lot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Substack, it's interesting. Sub, Substack is a phenomenon in media. First, tell me, tell me how you see that. Yeah. So Substack is um, it's it's a platform that makes it incredibly easy for people to produce their own high quality, good looking content um, and create um, you know an effective the, the equivalent of a mailing list. Mm. Where people get your your they sign up and they get your your writings you know in their inbox. Um, but it also allows writers the opportunity to be paid for it. Um, and I think one of the things that that I don't think I appreciated, but which I do more so now, is that um, media is not gone and reporting is not gone. People are still willing to pay for good content. Mm-hmm. Um, and it does, you know, there's not an advertisement on my site at all. Um, and so, um, you know, to say that I work for, you know, hundreds or thousands of people out there, it's you know that's kind of a privilege, and it shows that people care. The the big substacks, the um, you know the, the Matthew Iglesias or Barry Weiss, or, you know, or even Michael Schellenberger, you know, they have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of readers. They're like their own their own media corporations that yeah. you know in their kitchen. So I think it is an interesting phenomenon, an interesting development. Um, and, is that it, allows- and, is it, and, is, and is it due to uh, well? Why do you think that's happened? I mean, is it because of the legacy media uh, just lost favor that they lost credibility? Why? Why has sub- the 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 doxing or the you know the censorship of writers? Why, why has Substack succeeded? So, uh, in what I see is a relatively short amount of time. And I say that as a guy who's you know I used to load print newspapers and deliver them around town, which seems almost quaint these days. I had a paper out uh, on my bike. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so for me, I mean, I can only speak to my own personal experiences, but, but the overhead in time, energy, effort spent trying to place a piece, you know, with the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Financial Times was considerable. And, you know, I know, you know, if it has a circulation of 2 million people, you're reaching an enormous amount of people if you can right. have the privilege of being there. But for me, um, the negotiations with editors, the, you know, you can't say that because it's too controversial, you know, something like heat waves. Um, so now, like, you know, the New York Post came to me um, and said, you know, we like what you've written. Can you write something for us? Um, you know, simplify it, make it shorter is what they said. And uh, happy to do that. But that was because of my sub stack, not some other huh. effort. Interesting. So, yeah. So, so, so for legacy, me, me, legacy media coming to new media. Right. That's and so for me, I, I have what I would call a, an incredibly high quality set of subscribers. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of a niche guy, you know, talking about science and politics and climate emergencies and transgender athletes. It's not for everybody, but I have the ability to reach 
pretty influential people in policy positions around the world. Hmm. And as a policy professor, um, if I had to design an instrument for impact, it would be a lot like Substack. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, I have a lot to say, which is fine. I've been doing this for a long time. So, uh, you know, there's no shortage of content and I enjoy it, which also makes a difference. It's not for everybody, but I have been incredibly uh, motivated and, and um, energized by, you know, the, the, my inbox every morning when I wake up and see the comments I get from people from around the world is just incredible. And I've never seen anything like it in my career. Mm. Yeah, I've I've debated the Substack move. I, I, well, we've talked about it, but it's uh, it, what I do like and what I, what you're here saying is just reduces friction in getting yeah. the public, th and that's to me really important because I've seen you know for a long time the same kind of friction trying yeah. to fit through a funnel, right, right, to get to an audience of the existing media, and it can be laborious. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no doubt about no doubt about it. Well, just a few more questions, Roger. We've been talking for uh, almost an hour now, and again, my guest is Roger Pilkey Jr. on his fourth fourth appearance on the power hungry podcast uh tied for the lead with meredith angwin uh, he's on substack roger pilkey jr roger pilkey jr dot substack dot com and he's on twitter at roger pilkey jr so whose work are you, are you following these days we i always ask you about what you're reading what uh what what books are you reading on uh or what do you have on your bookshelf or on your desk right now yeah so i am i am uh you know i teach an energy policy class and then this past spring um obviously um, with Russia and Ukraine, I focus a lot of attention on European energy. So I'm doing a lot of new Twitter followers, uh, you know, people with expertise, particularly industry and the people that serve industry um, on, on European energy issues mm -hmm. and that, you know, the depths and complexities of um, Europe and its energy is something that's been, I've been spending an awful lot of time with. Um, this summer, I've been quite active um, working um, with sports organizations on developing policies related to transgender athletes. Mm. Um, and so there's a fascinating history there. Um, and there's also, you know, really interesting science, physiology, biology uh, to get into. Um, and then this fall, I'm going to be, you know, you know, kind of returning to the pandemic issues and the science policy issues associated with the pandemic. And, um, you know, I'll, I will certainly be learning a lot about Norwegian science policy um, I did a workshop in Norway about a decade ago on uh, science and policy between the U.S. and Norway, uh, but I haven't really been up to date on that. So that'll be, you know, a next thing for the next five months. Hmm. Well, so well, full disclosure, I finally got COVID. Did you get? Have you had COVID? I had COVID in November 2020. Uh huh. So you got it. Got it out of the way. I got it out of the way. I had a high school student who caught it at a Halloween party and came home and. <laughs> ah. Nice. Thank you. We weren't, we weren't sealed off from the Thanks, son. Yeah. yeah right. But, but it, you, you may get it again, right? I mean, that's the other looming possibility here. But wasn't Norway held up early on as one of the models to follow in, in terms of, of, of policy? Did that, how did that work out? I know that I saw that early on, but did that, yeah. did their, did their approach, was it better than what we saw in the U.S.? How was it different? <laughs> than, was it, yeah, was well, it I mean, okay. It, was it better than the U.S.? Yes. Um, the U.S. had, I mean, the U.S. response for a, a number of reasons was, was highly problematic under the Trump administration, not just because of the Trump administration, but because of really years of lack of preparation right. for a pandemic like this to occur. So there's a long story we can go into. And, you know, the Biden administration hasn't, in fact, corrected some of the shortfalls of the Trump administration. And one, an obvious one, the Trump administration had no high level science, scientific advisory body on COVID. It had its coronavirus task force, but that was a bunch of political appointees, mm -hmm. right, who were telling Donald Trump what he wanted to hear. Um, I thought when the Biden administration came in, they would immediately put in place a high level advisory committee on the pandemic, not to tell them what to do, but to tell them what they could do. Right. And, you know, to, to help get the data ship shape and so on. Um, the U.S. hasn't done that. And so many countries, you know, Canada, Norway, Japan, New Zealand um, had really good science advisory mechanisms. Um, but. You know, as, as we've discussed before, having good science and good advice doesn't necessarily translate into good policy. Right. So there's a, a, a you know, a really intense debate in Scandinavia going on um, about, you know, who actually did better. Norway, Sweden, which kind of had a let it rip approach. Mm -hmm. um, Finland, Denmark. Uh, and so I don't I, I think it's too early to tell, actually, um, you know, who, who had the, the best that's responses. Right, because, the, because the pandemic isn't over yet. I mean, it right. just seems like it just keeps lingering, which, I mean, right. I don't know if you've been in the airports lately, but they are packed. I mean, yeah. people are out and they are spending money. And yeah. 
which is gratifying in one sense. And then it's also like, well, what recession? I don't, I don't see any. Right, right, right. Um, but let's talk about the, your work in sports too, because uh, I'm a big sports fan, although we took the TV out of the house and I'm don't, you know, it's summertime and I don't really care about baseball. Maybe I'll, right. you know, basketball starts up again. I'll get a television again, but right. tell me what the cap tie rule is because you put, you wrote about this as well. And your work on transgender athletes and, uh, uh, Castor Semenya, am I getting that yep. right? Um, I mean, it's really been intriguing how you're looking again at this issue, the, the, this uh, this uh, overflow or over the, the the boundaries between politics and and uh, science. Um, tell me what the 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 cap tie rule is, because I thought yeah. it was an interesting way to think about transgenderism, particularly with regard to this uh, swimmer at uh, University of Pennsylvania, Leah Thomas. Is that not yeah. right? Yeah. 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 So there's a, a lot of complexities on this issue. But the first one, so Castor Semenya, the South African middle distance runner um, who was effectively banned by her uh, international federation. Um, she's actually born a woman, raised a woman, has always been a woman, never changed categories. And so there's a separate debate about what do we do with certain women who have high testosterone and maybe too good? Mm. Right? So put that aside. Um, the, the transgender elite athlete debate is about uh, individuals who, who legally um, transition from one gender to the other, men to women, women to men. And so one the most important proposal that I think could be implemented, um, and it's one I you know everybody yells at me about, um, is what I call a cap tie rule. So in international soccer, international football, if you play for one country, you are tied to that country. So a cap basically means it goes back to the UK. You earned a, a cap when you participate in international competition. So if you earn a cap for a country, you can't then go play for another country. So, so if you I might play be a, for the, so if the U S men's national team invites me to play soccer and I'm expecting their invitation any day now, <laughs> Um, if I play for them, even in one game, I can't then go play for Trinidad or, I exactly. don't know, you know, exactly. Britain or France yeah. or somewhere. Even that's, that's sure the they, essence I'm of the sure they would. I'm sure they want me to, but I'm yeah. going to say no, because I've already played for the Americans. So that's the cap tie rule. Yeah. And, then, and the reason that was there was so that, um, you know, countries like, for example, Qatar and Bahrain couldn't go to Brazil and say, oh, we're going to give you a passport and $20 million. Come play right. for our team. And just, so a for cap this, time, just for this World Cup thing, right? right, yeah. right, or, right. The, or the Kuwaitis or the Saudis right. or whoever else has money, it could go right. in and buy the best players. But the cap tie rule says, no, you can't do that. And what you're talking about with new. So how would that apply to gender? Would so apply, in, in the context, to, would it apply to Leah Thomas? Yeah. So in the context of gender eligibility for men's and women's, women's competition, the basic idea is that if you have comp competed already, at an elite level, and we could argue about, you know, where do you draw the line at an elite level, but NCAA or, or international Olympic level competition, if you compete in the men's competition, you're tied. You can change your gender, you can change your passport and your driver's license. That's, you know, that's all great legally, but you cannot then compete in the women's category and vice mm -hmm. versa. You're tied to that original classification that you competed in. What people don't generally understand um, is that it's not just our biology that makes us exceptional athletes. I'm sure in general, men are better athletes uh, than women, but another big factor is years of training, mm -hmm. specialized expertise in perfecting your craft. So if you had a cap tie rule, um, I think most of this issue goes away because you're not just gonna get you or me who say, oh, all of a sudden I'm gonna transition to a woman and, and dominate the Olympics. Right. Elite, elite women athletes are phenomenal. Yeah. So if you're not already an elite or close to elite level male athlete, you know, good luck. And so if you think about the, the cases that that come to the public's eye in the most recent Olympics or in the NCAA, these are all athletes who transitioned after already being an elite athlete. Right. So if you implement a cap tie rule, I think that reduces the scope of the issue. It's a fair policy. Um, we have precedent for it. Um, but, you know, it's like anything else in our society today. People don't want to take the heat out of issues. They like they like the the emotions that it stirs up. So you haven't had much support for this then? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, there's a lot of discussion about it behind the scenes. I, I, I would say we haven't yet seen it implemented or proposed at the international level. Um, we'll see if it ever does. Um, World Athletics, which does track and field, has kind of a reverse cap tie rule. They say if you transition from women to men, men to women, you can't go back for four years, right? You're stuck in that category. 
So they, they already have the, the essence well, of the that rule. Would be a, that would be a pretty, uh, pretty small, pretty small yeah. group of people that would go transition once and then transition again. I mean, that's you know a fairly this small whole, universe. Everything about this issue involves very small numbers of people. <laughs> that's one <laughs> thing people need. That's, that's a fair number, but I, a fair point. But I guess what the one case that you're talking about, I, who was it, the man who became a woman that then later played at Wimbledon. Now this is... Uh, uh, Renee Richards? Renee Richards, thank you. But that was so Renee Richards would not have been able to then compete right. uh, because Renee Richards had already committed or had already competed as a male right. and couldn't then just say, well, I'm back and that right. there wouldn't have been that controversy. Got it. OK, um, so I asked you about what you're reading and you, you, you didn't you deferred on the on the books, but uh, we're coming to now more than an hour. So uh, we talked we started talking about the perils that are in the world today and what all the the things that are worrisome what gives you hope what i mean we've i always ask my guests this because i want to always end on a hopeful note and i'm optimistic are you are you remain optimistic and if so why yeah and i think i mentioned this to you before i think in in order to participate as a policy scholar a policy analyst over years and decades you kind of have to have a built-in optimism um because the the issues we deal with the challenges we deal with they are hard and, and it can seem for a very, I mean, I tell my students this who, you know, don't have, you know, a long perspective that, that the, the moment may be really frustrating and you can feel frustrated, but start taking a look at the longer arc of history. And, you know, the, the things I raise are, you know, the, the expansion of human life, life spans, you know, right. doubling in the last century, the, the, the ability to grow more food and feed more people um, using less land. Agriculture is just amazing. Yeah. Um, the, the economic growth and the reduction of poverty um, worldwide, which is one of the most phenomenal features. Um, I, I've taken to telling people about the 99.9% the .9 decrease in natural disaster deaths over the last century. It is phenomenal. It's amazing. So if we apply that perspective on our challenges like securing energy supply or decarbonizing the economy, um, yeah, they're really hard, but over decades, I'm pretty optimistic that if we decide we want to do that, like we have on lifespans and agriculture, um, there's no reason why humans can't achieve those outcomes. Um, so, yeah, the political slog is tough in the moment, but um, you know, people like me who have the privilege to offer expertise and commentary, our job is to give people some viable options, not to solve these problems, but to get to the next stage. You know, we want next year at this time, we want to be better off than we are right now. And so, you know, it's those sort of incremental steps. You add them up over 10, 20, 50, 100 years, and boy, all of a sudden you've gotten someplace. So that's what makes me optimistic. Well, that's a good place to stop then. Uh, Roger, thanks for being back on the podcast. It's always great fun. Robert, always fun. I appreciate it. Yeah. And thanks to all of you in podcast land. Uh, 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 by the way, you can find Roger. He's on, uh, on, he's a, uh, you can't escape him. He's on all uh, media platforms, Roger Pilkey Jr. Dot substack dot com or on Twitter, Roger Pilkey Jr. Uh, Roger, thanks again. And thanks to all of you in uh, podcast land. Give me five, 10, 20, 50 stars on your rating and uh, tune in for the next episode of this podcast until then. See ya. Mm -hmm.